hit it, Phil. Can it be the breeze that fills the trees with rare and magic perfume? Oh, no. It isn't the breeze. It's Jackson time. La, da, da, da. All right. Well, Jill, again, this is Buck Benny speaking. I am joined by John Henderson, and I have Vincent Longo, and we have Kathy fuller Seely with us. Uh, I'm so delighted to uh, have them and, and to be able to do this, um, this presentation that I've wanted to do for years and haven't had access to this. Uh, Kathy mentioned to me that uh, this um, presentation, we're going we're gonna to do this film we're presenting, This Way Please, with Mary Livingston was uh, available out there on the internet. And so we watched it and uh, I, I was always thinking, okay, this is her only film by herself. It's probably not gonna be that great, so forth. I personally, I really, really enjoyed it. And, and I enjoyed her and seeing her in, on her own and not relying on Jack. Now, they did take a lot of pieces of her character from the Jack Benny show and bring it over there. If you're a, a fan of the Jack Benny show, you will hear a lot of things that are familiar, especially up front. And then, then it goes more into the story, but uh, I loved it. And we're, so we're going to talk today about both the film and we'll present the film, whether if you're on my podcast, you'll hear the film in audio form. If you're on YouTube and watching this on YouTube, if it didn't get pulled down or anything, then, then uh, that's great. Well, and you can, can enjoy it there. That, that's it. Or you can give directions to how to find it on archive.com. So. Yeah, that's right. So, so we'll, 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 we'll see what happens and then, and we'll go from there. But uh, so for in the audio format, we're going to first play the Jack Benny radio show, and then we'll go into the movie after that. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll get the movie first, because I'm assuming that's what you'd like to see. And then if you hang out after the movie, you'll get a chance to hear the radio show, Jack's episode, where they talk about this movie that, that Mary's in. And, that, and I like the radio episode, too. So let's first uh, quickly chat about the radio episode, and then we'll go into the movie, I think is what we'll do. So. Um, John, did you have anything about the radio episode you want to point out or anything? Yeah, I thought it was a fun radio episode. It's an early episode. This is 1937. Yes. So it's always interesting to hear that era of the radio show. But in particular, this episode, because it's an unusual episode, normally they go and they visit Jack at his movie set. And this one, they're going and they're visiting Mary at her movie set. And I loved the thing that they did with that where she's like this, suddenly she's like this, uh, you, you know, hard to work with actress and, and sort of emulating some of the other actresses of the time. I thought that was lots of fun. I, I agree. I, it, was, it was neat to see an episode that centered more on Mary. You just don't get many episodes that center on Mary. And so to get that, I, I love that about this episode. And I love, yeah, the whole thing. I, I, it was a very enjoyable episode, and it makes it different just because it's about Mary, and I think it's fantastic. Kathy, anything that you have on the episode? Well, you want to well I, I agree with you all very much, and it sort of raises the question of the what ifs. What if Mary had Mary Livingston, the Mary Benny, had chosen to grow her career this way? She could have become, you know, a fairly regular um, a film comedian. Um, you know, it, it would have shaped the show differently had she taken on more of a public persona. Um, and, and I think she was quite capable of it. Um, you know, here on the radio show, we see her being her sort of bubbly, slightly snarky self. I love, John, as you say, uh, how she uh, puts on the garbo. She puts on the temperamental actress that, you know, she doesn't often get to have that much uh, dialogue or be that large a player. I'm curious if you all can tell me, do the shows from early fall, from fall night, October 1937 exist? Um, because um, Laura Leibowitz, you know, gives us synopses of them in her book, but I'm not sure, I can't remember if I've heard them in radio compilations, because um, this was a June 1937 episode while she was actually filming the film, and it was, the film was released in mid-October 1937, October 15th, which I think, because when we talk about the film, we'll say it's not the biggest A spectacular. It's probably a B programming feature, which I might have thought would have come out during the summer um, because Benny's films often came out during the summer 
um, right. oh, 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 to, to, um, to satisfy radio fans. The, the thinking at the movie studio was during the summer, if you missed hearing Jack Benny, you might go to see the movie. This movie came out in early fall, uh, October 1937, geared, I think, to um, um, draw on that publicity it was getting on the radio. But uh, as I said, as Laura says, um, uh, 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 Mary's the premiere of Mary's show, uh, re positive reviews of the film, and her appearing in an article in the Hollywood Reporter are all mentioned in those early October radio episodes. Yeah, I was just checking out this great website. Do you recognize those? Uh, Thisdaybenny.com, and it uh, it says there's October 3rd, both the East Coast and the West Coast version are available, and then the 10th of 24th. So, yeah, those, those episodes are well, available. Yeah, and just so you right. know, um, unlike John, I don't have to refer to some uh, some gadget that I have in my hand. I can do it by <laughs> memory. I know, that, <laughs> I know that we're missing... Uh, I happen to remember this because uh, we're missing two episodes in that run in the fall. And the two we're missing are the, uh, what, the second appearance of Rochester and the third appearance of Rochester are both missing. Um, and those happen to be, I think, the only episodes that are missing in the run in the fall. So, okay. well, uh, so well, other than we'll that, we'll, and, we'll you need, and, and, that and, you'll, and you will find those scripts for us. And someday will we will them. have them and present them. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have a question about Mary's career here. I mean, it sort of segues um, yeah. or connects the radio to the film itself. But I was kind of surprised um, watching the film that Mary was top billed in this. I mean, she plays a, in a um, you know, a fairly sizable part, but not the largest part. And so I'm curious if, if you all could talk a little bit more about um, where she had come from and how it motivated this, this billing here. Yeah, exactly. It's strange billing. To, to, to me, mm -hmm. it's 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 awkward billing because uh, it's sort of like everybody else is billed like normal, right. and then it's like and Mary Livingston or something, and and, and kind of bigger font and things, right. so you know, yeah. yeah, right. See, there you go. That shows it exactly. Yeah. And the other I, poster has like a little bubble of her head. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 So so, so it's just interesting how they did that, and I think <laughs> it's because of the people in it, other than the top actors, she was well known, but she didn't have a huge, as big of a part as some of these people. So they didn't feel like they could really have somebody with a smaller part be further up in the list probably. So they said, okay, let's just do it separate. And so that's, I, I think why they did it that way. You're right. It's like the special guest star on an yeah. episode of The Love Boat or mm -hmm. something like right, that. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and she has, a far bigger part than I thought she would. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, I, I was thinking, yeah. okay, they're playing up her radio thing and she's going to be on in like a couple scenes and that'll be it. But she actually had a substantial role in this film throughout the film. And I, I, I go ahead. I had sort of the, op I mean, I guess it all depends on your expectations. Yeah, going right? In. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, if you, I, if I you expected... just went by the poster, you'd go, oh, she probably has a really big part. But in my head, I was going, oh, no, they're yeah. playing us up. But anyway, but. And having heard this radio episode, I thought, well, oh, she's got, you know, maybe not, yeah. obviously not the main part, but I thought she would have, like, a more substantial part. And it opens with her with a pretty big scene. And that's her biggest scene of the whole movie. So yeah. I, I thought I was a little disappointed there wasn't more Mary Livingston. Yeah. Right. But in a way, it's typical of kind of um, a type of Hollywood B feature that's a little bit more like, um, uh, you know, that would be a one-off special on TV in right. the 70s, in the 60s or 70s. So to me, it was a little bit more like a vaudeville program. Um, um, mm -hmm. Instead of having a strong plot, we've got the sort of bits and attractions of, of various things. And of course, that will fit right into eventually Vincent getting to tell us about the uh, the ways that um, these two different things, vaudeville stage shows and movies, uh, uh, getting uh, um, put up next to each other yeah. more often than we might remember. Um, a 30 second dump that was so kind of you uh, to Vincent to ask for it on Mary Livingston. She was not a professional. She grew up in Vancouver and then down in Los Angeles, um, a middle class family. Um, she went through uh, high school and she was working at the May Company selling hosiery or whatever stocking counter at the May Company. Her older sister, had married a vaudevillian, um, uh, and 
So uh, it was that vaudevillian, a violinist, who invited Jack to, you know, that's so that that's how Mary and Jack meant, uh, met in Los Angeles when she was about 18. And the older sister, I think on something like a double date or something like that, introduced Jack to Mary. Jack was significantly older. Isn't he like 10, 12 years older? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's of course, Mary's. Older. Yeah, Mary's birth date is always um, very vague. She kept yeah. making herself younger, and uh, but um, so uh, they get. But then by doing that, I think it's so funny. Let me jump on that really quick of her making herself younger. But we always knew when she married Jack. So then it started becoming: Did she marry him when she was twelve or eleven, <laughs> or what happened here? And so that, that's what when you have a certain date that everyone knows that's the date, and then you you're playing with your age it makes things kind of awkward in the in those but really jack's always 39 so it's fine <laughs> yeah so a 39 year old so, marrying an 11 year old i don't think that's such a great <laughs> idea probably <laughs> no no not at all but uh, but so mary was very much a non-professional and um but jack in those days when they married in 1927 28 he was appearing sometimes with a um a female assistant on the Broadway, um, uh, on the vaudeville stage, and um, a, a just sort of a, a, a flighty young dumb girl who um, he could um, exchange, you know, jokes with. And whether Jack wanted her on stage or she was bored sitting backstage with all the beautiful showgirls, um, they, they came up with many stories about how she joined him, accidentally joined him in his act. But they were together mm -hmm. quite a lot then. When, Ray, when Jack starts on the radio show in 1932, he starts by himself. And um, I have a theory that um, at their first renewal at 13 weeks, Mary Livingston shows up on the radio show in, um, uh, uh, as a fan from Plainfield, New Jersey, as Harry Kahn wrote her character. And so um, uh, supposedly she didn't really want to do this, it, uh, but she did it and um, she was her laughter and character made her got great responses from fans. And so she ended up staying um, because of the machinations of, of them switching sponsors any number of times after that. She suddenly became the continuity. Um, and so her part became larger. And she was Jack's, um, uh, the, that character of the, the, the young, slightly flighty, but snarky sidekick. And she got snarkier and snarkier as time went by. Uh, fans, I guess, enjoyed her. I certainly think she's a huge part of the show. I, I think she brings something completely unique from all the other players to the Jack Benny show, and it wouldn't be nearly the show it is. She's a, to me, she's as important as Rochester is to the show, and that's pretty important. Well, and it's interesting that this is just before Rochester came. And at yeah. that time, you know, Mary's the big thing. And then in a few years, or at least a decade, Rochester will be the main thing who will be, you know, on the poster as an aside, you know? Yeah, um, true. Yeah. I, I did think it was interesting that they, they really played up her radio persona, especially in that first scene, where even before we see her, we hear her signature laugh. Yep. And they set up right before that, that, uh, oh, she's allowed to do wisecracks because she's related to the owner of the theater or whatever. But again, they set that up and then they, after that first scene, they didn't do much with it. No, I agreed. Uh, I, I, I'm with Kathy on, on this one a little bit, that, that there are, this is her first feature on her own. So I totally see why they would give her a part like this. Uh, they're 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 cashing in on her name because she's a pretty much a household name along with Jack, and they're sort of trying her out. Can she do film? Can we pull this off? And I think if you're watching this, I think you'd say, yeah, she can pull this off. And if she wanted to, I would think she would be featured in more films and bigger films as she went on. And I think she could, we could be in a completely different situation today where we're talking about her as being one of the famous comedians of, of our time um, sure. and, and uh, from, from films she would be in and so forth, perhaps. It wouldn't surprise me. I would like to see more films with her. If, just seeing who, not, not knowing Mary, but I mean, just seeing how, 
it's hard to describe it. Um, we'll 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 use Star Trek terms because I'm a. <laughs> There you go. Oh, so we yeah, have, but I don't even know if John will pick up on this because I don't think he's watched this series yet. But, but in uh, the newest Star Trek series, it's really caught on fire and everybody loves it. Uh, Strange New World. They have Nurse Chapel on there, and the person playing Nurse Chapel is Jess Bush. Well, Jess Jess Bush, she's not featured a lot. She hasn't had an episode that centers on her. Really, she's had she's been in the background in a lot of the episodes, but. Every scene she's in, she steals the scene from whoever, doesn't matter who she's with, it doesn't, nothing matters. She, and, and the fans, you either love her or hate her, but most people love her. And I love her. I think she's fabulous. And she actually reminds me a little bit of Mary in some ways. So, so this Mary is in that same way in this movie where whenever she's on the screen, at least for me, I want to see more of it. I, she leaves me wanting more, and that's what you want in a, in a performance. Everything else in this movie, to me, is fairly flat and doesn't work all that great. I mean, it's, it's a fine B picture. It, I think it's, it's well worth watching. But to see Mary and, and just the way she presents things, the way she delivers lines, I, I, I really like it. And, and we don't get a visual of Mary very often, even in Jack's films a lot of the time. You might have Mary in there, but she might be on the radio. Oh, at, at, no. She ne she never appears. Only her voice is heard in Buck Benny. There you go. So, so and then you you see her on the uh, on the television show, but that's years later, um, and it's an an older Mary and things. I would like to see this younger Mary more often, and I think it's too bad we didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You but I'm glad she did this one film, and I'm glad I got to see it. So that's I'm delighted with that. Um, yeah. But let's let's talk more about the film, though, as we as we'll, we'll segue from the from the uh, radio show into the film. Uh, wh what else uh, stood out with the film? Let's let's go to Vincent and have him give us a little bit. Go ahead. Yeah, I really I really enjoyed the film. Um, I felt like there were a lot of moments in particular where um, Betty Grable really shined. I think there's they still hadn't quite figured out her stardom but there are some moments that are just like you you understand that she's going to become a major star you can just tell by the looks the close-ups you know the glamour photography there were a couple moments especially at the beginning of the film that i really i really thought okay this is this makes sense to me because she was a a budding star at the time uh, she had been in a bunch of stuff but not quite um to the star level and so i thought i uh started to see that in this film um a quick note biographically too is that Betty Grable would end up marrying a band leader, uh, Harry James, later in 1943, and so there's some loose connection here. However much I disliked the ending of this film, I mean, not even from just a Hollywood perspective. I mean, just truly, I thought the ending was disturbing. Um, <laughs> worth the watch, certainly, but I was I was shocked. I, mean, I was shocked that that's what happened. Um, uh, yeah, and, and Harry James was known to perform in movie theaters like this, and uh, he was famous, in, in fact, for getting audiences to dance in the aisles of the movie theater to get ushers to come out and try to stop people from the stage and all this stuff. So there's like kind of interesting uh, biographical ties in there. Um, I would say, though, as a backstage musical, um, which just fits in, this sort of vaudevillian structure, loose narrative, right? It's not the it's not really the greatest one I've ever seen. It, you know, this, yeah. the performances are fine, uh, somewhat are engaging, but I think as a historical document, this film is almost singular. Um, and I mean that being that this uh, highlights live performances in movie theaters, vaudeville-like live performances in a way that movies do not of this period. In fact, mm -hmm. they're often completely rewritten. The only movie that I know of that gets kind of close, I'm ugh, forgetting the name of it, but there's a um, uh oh geez um jerry what's uh the famous duo dean and uh dean and jerry martin and lewis yeah. thank you uh in the 50s they perform they have an act in a movie theater at the paramount theater in new york but they make sure to not show movies and and live performance together and so i'll talk a little bit why hollywood wanted to write that out but this is one of the only clear-cut examples of this continuing and many people might know the story of vaudeville and its death and the idea that live performance goes away from theater showing movies. But in big theaters like this one, which is depicted to be very big, 
so big it has like you know the manager's offices in the top floor which some very prestigious theaters in cities did have that's um not common but not unusual and so what we get to see that we get to see literally like them talking about the show times when the movies were showing when the live performance was when the star and what i think is great about this movie is that it showcases the contradictions the complications of putting live performance and movies together the studios hated live performance in movie theaters they hated it for a lot of reasons but mostly because it detracted from the movie itself um, they also hated that it ruined this standardized entertainment of stars on screen they hated that they have to deal with stage hands they hated that they have to deal with the egos of the stars and we see all that unfurring as like the conflict of the film like oh i don't want to deal with that you know um buddy guy or whatever his name is brad um and that ends up being sort of the conflict of people on stage but the other thing that um, this film cements is that at its core, what um, these live performances, vaudeville-like live performances, sometimes they're called vaude film, is that it was a star-centered medium. We see, you know, the band leader shine, everybody loves him, young and old people, the film uh, points out, as the same with Betty Grable, you know, her face on stage and then on screen, and so we get to see the allure um, of all that. The other thing that's important to mention is the stage wedding, which is another thing that's um, was actually common and did happen. Uh, movie theaters advertised uh, people to get married on the stage all the time. I've always thought it was a little quirky. Uh, there's not much research or much uh, things on it, but this movie seemed to indicate that it was kind of hokey even to the people there. Like they were like, oh really, you wanna get married in the theater? Um, and so I learned something there that there's this sense that it was not like this, you know, these theaters were very, gorgeous and glamorous and i know people who get married in theaters now movie palaces like theaters and it's a very glamorous thing there seems to be the sense that it's like oh it's kind of hokey you know you're getting married yeah, on yeah. the stage yeah so i learned something and I, again this film may be the only film in the studio era that showcases the connection the continued connection between live performance and movies which happens all around the country in mega theaters like this really until the 50s and sometimes into the 60s so this is a important film, National Film Registry. I'm telling you, it's coming. Ah. I'm gonna nominate it. Do I'm it. telling you, I am. So good deal. Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it, Vincent. It was definitely worthwhile with you watching it. Then that, that's some information I would not have thought to bring in here. So great job, yeah. Kathy. What are your thoughts on it? Oh well, 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 lots, and thank you for for giving us this opportunity to play with it. Because just as you say, I'd known that she'd been in. I'd never seen it, and I'd always assumed it would just be really forgettable and you know and and awful. And I was charmed by many aspects of it. Um, hopefully, we'll go around. Um, I want gossip um, uh, that uh, Charles Buddy Rogers. I think he plays a real skunk of a character, and I didn't like his character Horrible. at all. Uh, but he had just married Mary Pickford, who was 12 years his senior. And she is supposedly an extra in the audience at the wedding scene at the end. So oh. if you look for a woman with sort of bob blonde hair, that's Mary Pickford. Um, so uh, as part of the multiple ways of publicizing the film, they said they had recently been married. And so she accompanied him on a national publicity tour of him taking his band around to different uh, places. They, I even found her in Richmond, Virginia years ago in another project. And I go, why was Mary Pickford in Richmond, Virginia? And it had to do with this film. So again, everything always comes together. Um, uh, 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 gossip from uh, IMDB claims that um, Shirley Ross, was supposed to have had the Betty Grable role. And the gossip on IMDb is that Shirley Ross, you only know her today for she originally sang Thanks for the Memory with Bob Hope. Okay, so otherwise she's a, a, a singer, a mid, mid to late 30s singer who never really got as big as Betty Grable. Um, but so, IMDb wants to give us some, some juicy gossip that um, Shirley Ross was, uh, she, it claims, was uh, unhappy, jealous of the amount of attention that Mary Livingston was getting in the film mm -hmm. and quit. Now, we know Mary Livingston doesn't get that much attention in the film, so I think it's just gossip. But if, if you know, there's our TMZ uh, uh, <laughs> a part of the film today. And I'll also mention, but um, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Buck, you're going to be able to show our viewers uh, some pages from the actual press book that Paramount put out to accompany the film. Press books were um, sent uh, to every uh, theater owner in the country who played this film. You send them about a month ahead of time or so. Um, and to think that movie theater managers might do special advertising to promote this film. Um, and so it includes- and, and just to interrupt for just a second. And that's not a small thing. It's a huge, uh, how many pages was that thing, Kathy, roughly? It was like 32, 36. It's, yeah, it's, it's not like a little pamphlet you, or something. No, and they do one for every single film, which just sort of shows the, the, the power and money of Hollywood and how much money it still took to put to release a picture. Um, but uh, local theater managers were given in this press book all kinds of stories they could plant in newspapers, all kinds of posters they could put up of not only in their own theater, but in around town. You tried to get one in the drugstore, you tried to get one in the clothing, women's clothing shops. So it's a fascinating document, but it gives us the story that supposedly Jack Benny appears as an extra in this film. There, uh, we Benny fans uh, loved to, to gossip about: Is he really in Casablanca, uh, or not? Uh, uh, of playing an extra role as a waiter, but supposedly here it's documented that he was in this film. Although in the version that we have to show today, we can't. Uh, that scene is not there. We think that Daryl has kidnapped it. <laughs> of course. So, of course, the, of course you did. The, the press book claims. Yeah, I'm knowing you. Uh, the <laughs> press book claims that that Jack was on the set watching from the sidelines, and Robert Flory, the director, sort of decided to. Uh, oh, that that he showed up, and uh, when Mary recognized him, she blew her line. A classic Mary move to uh, make a mistake. <laughs> so Flory decided to. Um, put Jack in the scene and supposedly it's a scene fairly I think fairly early in the film where there's a large crowd in the lobby of the theater as they're moving mm. toward the seats and this little article says that they actually gave him a line we don't uh, definitely not in the version we have to watch today and then they then Paramount paid him 60 cents for being an act uh, an extra and the they cut a check is what they said yeah, it should have been 39 cents, but okay. Yeah. Can we cut to a, can we take a commercial break and cut to a still of the press book? Yes, we can do that. Okay. Well, so man, that was a great picture. I really like that from the, uh, from the original booklet, the kind of the press book for the time. Uh, let's swing over to John and hear what John has to say about it. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I th thanks, Kathy, for sharing that press book. I thought it was so interesting that they made this enormous, you know, magazine so that people could use it in their own magazines uh, or whatever. They even have a page that's just like the women's page in case you've got a women's magazine and you want to talk about the uh, fashion in this way, please. Yep. So I thought that was pretty cool. Of course, as a Jack Benny fan, obviously I was paying most attention to Mary Livingston. You know, like as soon as she came on, I'm like, wow, that sounds just like Mary Livingston from the radio show. Yeah. Whereas I don't think about that when I see Jack Benny, because I'm used to seeing him and hearing him at the same time. But mm. I'm used to seeing pictures of Mary and then hearing Mary, and they're not usually put together like that. So that was fun. Now, I, maybe this is unimportant, but I was curious, um, I, I, Kathy, in, in your book about Jack Benny, you mentioned that she had a, a nose uh, job done. Now, is this pre or post? Pre. 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 Yeah. You can, so I, think, I, don't, I don't think her nose was that big, but she has a certain dark circles under her eyes that I guess go away when huh. she gets her. Yeah, yeah, she had, to me, at least, I mean, I'm not a, I don't judge people too much or whatever but it was one of the most effective nose jobs i've ever seen because because it uh, it really did it make her it made her nose a little less pronounced a little less uh it wasn't a bad to begin with was the eyes i mean like she says i think the the it just made that look a lot better so anyway. it's interesting that she did that and then also didn't continue to be in pictures so right yeah, but but yeah, I I also as a old time radio fan, I'm not, I haven't heard a lot of Fibber McGee and Molly, but I've heard enough to you know recognize them 
and uh, some of the things I didn't know that Molly did the voices of the old lady and especially the little, you know, Y mm -hmm. girl. I thought that was a clever way to get that in there because <laughs> it is fun to see her doing those voices. Uh, but, you know, I, I uh, yeah, I, I was pretty impressed by that, not knowing that she did the voices before. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I what one thing that just truly flummoxed me was why when they're on the stage doing a bit of their routine why do they then walk off the stage and fall into the orchestra pit that was a little odd so. i thought it was them it was showing that they were like amateurish like a lot of the, uh, the act they did was okay. so professional that i felt like the film was like the directors and the writers were like okay well we need to make it seem like they're not professional although okay. it did yeah. establish that the um Fibber McGee was a prof like a professional actor, right? They said that he was in the silent movie. So I agree. It was a little yeah, strange. I, I couldn't you know? get that. I didn't know whether they were like, whether that was like him, you know, saying something that wasn't true as a kind of boast or whether they were implying that he actually was in pictures. Yeah. I thought that was very strange. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Yeah. I, I, and if you I watch think Fibber yeah. McGee and Molly, they, they appear in multiple films over time. And a lot of times it's sort of awkward. It's like um, they almost feel like the film's written and they go, oh, we got Fibber and Molly. We'll put him in here and we'll throw him in there and we'll throw him. And they just kind of don't flow with the film usually. They kind of are just there. And right, that's how they're listening to in lots of ways. That's a great point because unlike Mary, they're not playing a character in the film. They're Fibber and and Molly. So yeah, right. again, that sort of shows the difficulty that Hollywood was having with these other rival forms. They wanted Fibber McGee and Molly in the film because they had a huge radio following and, you know, that would bring people to the theater, but they didn't know what to do with them when they got them. Yeah. Well, it's like Jack Benny's story, so. It definitely seems like they've got this regular rom-com, which was, which was a fine rom-com, and then they're like, but then also we'll throw this stuff in. You know, yeah. this will be the calm. Mm -hmm. This will be the comedy parts of it. Which, I mean, it worked. It basically, you're like you're watching two... It's like you're flipping channels and you're going between <laughs> the regular movie and then the, uh, the crazy uh, the comedies. Sure. And those are the kind of things they don't make, you know, Hollywood cinema. Now you have to spend so much money and make a blockbuster. Although there are aspects of blockbusters that have this little bit of this and a little bit of that. But you're absolutely right. This is a kind of Hollywood product that would, you know, disappear, I would say, with the coming of television and things like that. Well, I, and when I, folks watch this, I would, uh, as, as, I'm going to watch it again at some point, um, but y you might want to pick up on Molly from Fibber McGee and Molly and just see how she pulls this off, because this, at this point, as far as I can tell, this is right as her alcoholism is hitting its peak and she uh for a year she's not on the Fibber McGee and Molly show it's like Fibber and Company that they I think they call it or something um and she's uh getting help with that situation and so forth so um I think it's it's interesting that where this happens to fall and the year it's on and I'm, and I'm uh, you know I, I just think it's interesting in her history how this is and, and whether uh, even whether the alcohol affects his performance or anything like that, I'm not sure. I mean, she could have been a very functional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, when I when I was seeing her through this, I was going, okay, that's she's she still looks good. And the thing is, she always sounded good on the radio. I mean, I, I think maybe it was when they were off radio that she was having a lot of difficulties and things. But I'm glad they worked on that and and something that could have been life-threatening and that sort of thing. And yet she was able to to come back and do with me and Molly for years and years and years on up into the, the 1950s. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm glad that all worked out for her. Um, and it seemed like they had uh, such kind of a, uh, I don't want to say storybook, but like a, they just had a real wonderful romance together and everything. And I think it's great. So. You know, listening to a lot of uh, old radio shows, I do hear a lot of music from that era, but it's it's like the kind of music they played on Fibber McGee and Molly was like this sort of like quartet music. And on the Jack Benny show, it's Dennis Day and he's like big sweeping tenor stuff. I must say, I enjoyed the music in this movie 
much better than anything I've heard on the radio. It was, I didn't even know what you call that style of music where it's like this, this female chorus and the, the sort of like, it's, it's swing, but it's soft. I, I loved it. I thought it was delightful. Well, great. See, so there are a lot of reasons to watch this film. There really are. And they're very varied reasons. I mean, each one of us has pointed out different things from this film. I think, I think Vincent's was, was one of the most interesting in that this is the only film where you can catch that, the live feeling of, of what it was like in a theater at the time and, and, and so forth. And I, I think that's wonderful. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, another odd little thing that's interesting sort of in a, a film history uh, or Hollywood history kind of thing are the inside jokes the movie plays about mm -hmm. the film keeps going wrong. Um, uh, this business that you know it from Singing in the Rain, um, yeah. uh, this idea of, um, uh, you know, um, what the words coming out of the mouths of the people on the screen oh, are sure. not right. Yeah. Yes, and I, yes. you know, I, I love uh, instead of it being the record, uh, the Vita record being having skipped. Uh, uh, but so I thought that was really cute, and some other ways of sort of a rare poking fun, because uh, isn't it toward the end of the, the wedding scene where, or, or so, at some place where the the newsreel starts or the film starts mm -hmm. unexpectedly on them? The, Jack Benny did that a lot when he did stage shows. At, movie, at big movie theaters, he worked it into his act that he'd be getting ready to play his violin solo and the, suddenly the newsreel would come on and drown him <laughs> out. And so that idea of, of, of um, the different media battling with each other is kind of fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's great. There's, there's two things I think that were really interesting about that. One is though, this is a slight reversal on what you mentioned with like, um, you know, the usual like, oh, the sound technology is weird, right? So in the early sound era, it's the technology itself, which is a problem. In this one, it's all about the human error of, of these people because that's what they would have had a problem with in 1937. They would have had a problem, especially the studios. They wanted to standardize um, exhibition. They wanted to pull people out and just to be what they've curated on screen. And so they're the error, not the sound on disc. But we do see things that are very rare. I mean, in film history as well, like um, you notice that there was two different types of screens. Um, at the one point, they show like um, more like theatrical movie, and it's just like full screen. But when they show the newsreel, it's a smaller screen yeah. with uh, with the cutout. That's extremely rare to see those. You also see that the screens were placed in different parts of the stage. Um, so the placement of these things, like I said, this is a a true uh, historical document. The other thing I like to point out is I think who stole the show was the human sound machine. I loved that bit the rest of it when you see the acts on stage it didn't feel like what you might expect if you were in the audience at the time it was kind of choreographed like a movie but that was like much more something you'd expect to see at the time on the stages of these vaude film theaters but i just thought he was just really engaging you had the radio hookup on stage which you sometimes had in in theaters i loved it i i don't know yeah i thought it really worked they weren't all like big jokes but they were just well done um and i thought it was really fun now when you say that the cutout was rare to see you're that's the way that they always did it and you just don't usually see it on film is that what you mean yeah exactly yeah they're not pic usually when you see pictures of a movie screen you see like the full one right uh, because that's generally what they would show like the 35 millimeter i mean some, some newsreels were 35 millimeter as well but um, some newsreels were shown in this like matted screen, right? With the, and that's with what the they curved show. edges. So, so then yeah, cartoon exactly. shorts like Mickey Mouse, they've got the curved edges. Does that mean it would have been a smaller screen as well? Do you know? I don't know that for. I don't know much about the cart. Do you know, Kathy? I'm not sure. Um, um, no, I I assume they were big on the screen, but you never know what's been done to the cartoons to show them on television. So that's, I think it depends on the cartoon. So, you know. The, the media objects we have, have, you know, kind of sometimes been through so many iterations to fit different yeah. technologies. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I know there's some like Donald Duck cartoons from the 50s that are like in, you know, widescreen. But uh, the mm -hmm. earliest yeah. uh, Mickey Mouse cartoons on, on the DVD, they've got like this little box. Right. So we, yeah. Well, well the, the old Academy screen, what used to be the standard, um, uh, uh, that's much more like an old fashioned television. Um, and it was only the move in the 40s and 50s 
to the large screens in theaters where old theaters, they literally had to take the proscenium art, you know, they had to, uh, uh, you know, take jackhammers to the theater and get the old arches out to put in the big new screens. And they did that just to be different from little television sets. So uh, it's fascinating to see that uh, 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 how many different ways we can talk about the motion picture industry having mm-hmm. to deal with the challenges of of other industries, whether but it's live also, performance or radio or... Yeah, also the challenges of these big theaters. I mean, one thing that we think of, like, you know, there's some historians that talk about the movie palace as actually a horrible place to watch a movie because, they, you know, it privileges the stage, the stage entertainment. And so you see these weird placements of the screen, you know, and, and you see this in this movie in a way that it was sort of shocking. Like, I, you know, when the newsreel came on, I thought, this look, I, this looks bad. Like, I don't know if I would have wanted to watch this movie on this weird screen, you know, in this big theater. But that was a common complaint at the time is like, oh, it's all about the stage. It's not about the movie. And so that's one reason that film producers really hated this combination of live performance and movie theaters. They wanted like screens front and center, beautiful so that they could control everything. So Vincent, again, is, is really that cool. why the uh, switch to uh, like serials that they had and the, and the, the the cartoons and the double features and things to try and and force it where there wasn't enough time to do a live component yeah basically yeah yeah exactly i mean that's one argument for the um prevalence of um backstage musicals or even like you know um they became longer and so they and they basically had all the features of a vaudeville show this is another good example of that where you have all like the disparate acts i mean they're lightly connected in a narrative and so why do you need actual vaudeville because you have these movies and so they always had variety programs even in the 20s and uh in the teens so that wasn't new but the double feature is a a key a key killer of um of vaudeville because it just takes the space of it basically yeah yeah i can see that all right well uh Anything else on this that anyone's got? Well, that, that's, <laughs> does anybody know anything more about Ned Sparks? Um, uh, he wasn't quite a thing then, but it was like very grouchy. I mean, he reminds me a little of Fred Allen, but d- d- does anybody know anything more about Ned Sparks? So, I don't his know character turned me off, but yeah, sorry, go ahead, John. I, didn't mean to I was just going to say, I don't know anything about him, but I did enjoy it. He's He's obviously just a character <laughs> actor where it's just like, He's got his own distinct voice where you're not going to confuse him. You know, some of those leading men, you could replace them. You can't even tell the right. difference between them. But you get a Ned Sparks, you know that who that is. And I didn't, I wasn't crazy about the fact that Mary Livingston was like trying to convince him to marry mm-hmm. her. And that, it doesn't seem like yeah. Mary's usual character. But uh, but I, I did like him as a performer. Yeah. yeah. That's, also- I found very little, but I knew that I found he was born in 1883, which makes him 11 years older than Jack Benny. So, you know, that, so he's playing a little young, but that would make him a good 25 years older than Mary Livingston. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, right. But yeah, yeah. But I also did want to mention when we were thinking that Mary could have had a, we could imagine Mary having a continuing career. And uh, to point out that when I think what could Mary have become, I think of, uh, a comic actress like Rosalind Russell, pretty but not that pretty, or especially Eve Arden, who had that same kind of, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, snarkiness about her that Mary would develop. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's not unthinkable that Mary could have continued that into, into more roles. Well, right. she definitely could have been in the Jack Benny movies, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was possibly wasn't. one reason she had her nose done was to appear in Buck Benny Rides Again, and then she chose not to. So yeah, huh? It, it just so inter- her whole life is so interesting, and you can't tell the the facts and the fiction and the the made up. It's so hard to tell what goes on there. So I don't even really try. I just kind of enjoy what she's in and enjoy what we have of her. Because um, anytime you overlay the the rumors in the background and things it just detracts from her performances so i just enjoy her performances and that's what i try and do with pretty much everybody in, in hollywood because they all have bad stories about a lot of them yeah. no but, but you're right but this i i love this film ultimately as a document of how important mary was to the radio program in the 1930s 
Um, yes. uh, Vincent, so many of the early program uh, radio programs we don't have recordings of, right. and until I can get all the scripts out, it's real easy to just sort of pick up with the Rochester era and see Mary as this sort of increasingly off to the side, kind of almost bitterly snarky yes. person. But that she, tr the more I do research into the 1930s, uh, to see how she was widely beloved, very popular, um, uh, well worth, you know, trying to start. I can't, I don't blame Paramount for trying to star her in a movie. She really was, um, um, you know, uh, uh, the sidekick. Yep. To, to well, Penny. and at this point, you have to remember too that, as you said before, Rochester. Uh, hadn't even appeared as Rochester on the show yet at, at this point uh, when this episode that we hear today is from when the movie comes out yes he will have been in the show a few times but not enough times for to, to get a huge following yet right. uh, Phil is just uh, feeling out that character and the writers are getting better and better at writing it certainly this mm -hmm. last half of the season has been really good yeah. but again He's not what the, the show is known for at that time. He, right. He's and been on it for yeah. a year, but but it's really Jack and Mary that... that right, and, you, and you're right. Is. And the Kenny Baker character is becoming sort of more, a slightly more annoyingly stupid. He's yeah. never sweetly stupid like... Uh, uh, so, uh, the yeah. Kenny, ba Kenny Baker character. So. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the only other thing I'll point out is... For folks watching on YouTube, after we present the movie, then we have the radio show. During the radio show, I will show all of the pictures that we have from uh, the, what's it called again? The press book. From press the press book. book. And so that way you'll get a chance to see the press book and, and how it was laid out. And it's really interesting to see, if you've never seen a press book before, how that all is laid out. And, and uh, so that should be a, a nice piece to add. Uh, so. Anything else before we go? We all good? We'll end it there. So uh, enjoy this rare performance of Mary Livingston on a, a film screen and just uh, some wonderful performances by everybody all around. And I think Vincent's right when he's saying that uh, it's Betty Grable, right? That's that's the, yeah, she she's delightful to watch on screen. You can definitely see why she became such a big star and, uh, uh, it, it's it's kind of fun because this film kind of has two scene stealers between her and between Mary Livingston. I, I love both when either one's on the screen. I love it. And when they're on the screen together, it's a lot of fun too. So, all right, we'll end it there. So enjoy. See you guys next time.
Company, halt! At ease. There's a button off your coat. See that it's replaced. You've got on too much rouge. Wipe some of it off. What time does the newsreel go on? Uh, 11.21, uh, 2.57. There's a schedule in the locker room. What time does Brad Morgan go on? 11.30, 3.05, 6.40, and 10 o'clock. Where's Maxine? Doesn't she ever get here on time? Would you, if your uncle was the boss? <laughs> Attention. Left face. Forward. March. <laughs> It's none of my business, but this is my office, my typewriter, and my time you're taking up. My, my. Now listen, Maxine. Quiet, lady working. This is a business office. I got to get out some publicity. I'm helping you out, Inky. I'm putting novelty into your publicity. As for instance? Poetry. Is this it? Yes, read it. Poetry. That's the title. That's a novelty already. When you come to our theater, the management will gladly cater. Why, you don't rhyme, you see? Theater, cater, it's no good. What's the matter with your skull? Let me read it. When you come to our theater, the management will gladly cater. See? Well, for the sake of argument, no, but read on. For our efforts are untiring to whatever you're desiring. Day and night we are perspiring to give the most for the least money. Have you got a pistol? A pistol? What for? Let it go. Inky, don't get sore. I only wanted to give you some new ideas so my uncle will give you a raise and then we could get married. I'm satisfied now. If you're afraid to speak to uncle, I will. Oh, no, you don't. If Mr. Crawford thinks I'm worth a boost, I'll get a boost. Inky, I'm proud of you. So proud I'd marry you even without a raise, if you'd ask me. Well, I'm not going to ask you. I mean, uh, no raise, no marriage. I'm looking for work. Oh, of course. And specialties. I'm sorry, I'd like to help you, but I'm the director of sanitation. The stage door is down the alley to your left. All ready to start. Start, 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 start. Thanks, 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 thanks. Start, 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 start. Brakes fixed. Heavenly days, McGee. Are you lost again? McGee, a man winked at me. Well, we all make mistakes. Why, it's Brad Morgan. Well, that's the heartbreaker that played the theater in Wistful Vista some time back, ain't it? Had all the gals gaga. He even gave you an autograph, didn't he, Molly? Yes, and I want to see it. Oh, now, wait a minute, Molly. We're way behind in our schedule as it is. I don't care. I want to see Brad Moore. But, Molly, we can't park here. No, you can't park there. Oh, I can't, can't I? I guess you don't know who you're talking to, bud. I'm Fibber McGee. I carry a lot of weight where I come from. Why, Fib O'Toole, when did you leave Wistful Vista? Molly! Mrs. McGee to you, son. That's my wife. <laughs> you haven't changed a bit since you were a girl, Molly. If ever there was anything funny around, you got it! <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in town? Oh, we just stopped by to see the show. But, Molly, we can't park here. Can we, officer? No. See? 
Yes, we can. Can't we, Jim? Yes, Molly. And what's more, I'll mind the car. Come on, McGee. Oh, sure. And furthermore, I don't like the way you talk. I guess you don't want to marry me. Your guess is as good as mine. What do we owe this riot? I want to see Brad Morgan. He doesn't go on till noon. You can have him for lunch. Who are you and where do you come from? We're from Wistful Vista, bud. And I want to see Brad Morgan. I think we got something here. All the way from Wistful Vista to see Brad Morgan. Some drawing power. Romance at the old crossroads. Heartthrobs in the sticks. <sighs> if that's not a newspaper story, I'm a monkey's uncle. How's your nephew? Say, folks, I got a great idea. Step into the show shop and relax. What about Brad Morgan? Oh, skip Morgan. Go in and see the show. Later, drop up to see Mr. Crawford. He's our manager. I'll be there, and I think we can sell him a bill of goods. It's a date. Come on, McGee. Oh, thanks, bud. You folks ever come to Wistful Vista? Well, we'll go there on our honeymoon. Uh-huh, but don't wait up for us. Come in. Good morning. The stage doorman told me to see you. Yes, we need one girl. Will you take off your hat, please? Oh, I'm afraid my hair will be a sight. How tall are you? Five feet five. Send Maxine Barry up. What's your name, please? Jane Morrow. You've had experience? Oh, yes, sir. Lots of it. I just finished... This is just temporary, anyway, even if you fit our costume. First, I want to see how you look in it. Yes, sir. Are you standing in a puddle? Put them down. This is Miss Morrow. Give her a Hawkins outfit and explain some of our general rules. Uh, rule number one. If you're going to wear your dresses that high, don't ever walk by the musician's room. Come on. Well, how do I look? Oh, you look swell. I'm kind of jittery. One show and then it'll all be over. Oh, I hope the dance routines aren't too hard. I'd much rather sing than dance. Wait a minute. We don't dance. We're usherettes. Usherettes? Yes. Well, I thought I was hired as a chorus girl. Well, you've been hired under false pretenses. I don't know anything about ushering. But whatever it is, I need work. It's a cinch. All you have to do is please the customers, which is no cinch. You must meet all kinds of people. I'll say. But all you have to worry about are the men. They may come in the theater alone, but they don't want to go home that way. Oh, I see. Yes, they're all either misunderstood or lonesome. And another thing, watch out for sailors on shore leave. They think they have a girl in every aisle. <laughs> I guess the tired businessman is safest. Yeah, but be sure he's tired. Well, I guess we better go now. Oh, this feels so good. I know, but what do I do? I'll show you. Well, first of all, I get your flashlight. Just tell the customers to follow you down the aisle, then walk off and leave them. Leave them? Sure. Then if they don't find seats themselves, go back and tell them to keep moving. It's very simple. I hope so. <laughs> Here's your flashlight. You carry this, but you never use it unless somebody trips. Then you flash it on so they can see what they stumbled over, if they're interested. Sounds easy. Uh, this is your post. The house opens and the picture goes on in five minutes. You'll find a stack of programs up on the balcony just outside the projection room. And make it snappy because Mr. Stu Randall's a very tough boy.
the thrill of a new temptation. All that I really feel tonight. Where's Miss Morrow? She went upstairs with the program. We'll get another girl to show these people of their seats and then come with me. That's all, girls. I only hope the number goes as well on the stage. You better hurry along now. Have we time for a sandwich? Sure, you bet. Good. We'll be back in half an hour. All right, fine. Now, you're a long way from aisle three. I'm sorry, Mr. Randall. To tell you the truth, I got so interested listening to Mr. Morgan's song that, well, I forgot all about my job. Well, thanks. I'm glad to know your little usherette appreciates talent when she hears it. Thanks again. Jane, you better be getting back to your aisle. Well, that's not necessary. We'd better have a talk in my office. sunbath and peace and quiet. It's about that new usherette. Stu Randall's gonna fire and the poor kid needs the job. So what? You know she should have been at her post instead of being up here like a girl in a trance listening to Brad Morgan. Girl in a trance listening to Brad Morgan? Hmm, <sighs> not bad. Are you crazy? Just inspired, my little pigeon. You'll make the fifth girl I've had to let go on account of Mr. Morgan. It's time somebody paid less attention to him and more attention to work. I have no interest in him. In fact, if you give me another chance, I'll promise to forget Brad Morgan for the rest of my life. I tell you, boss, it's terrific. Every newspaper in town will go for it. Theater aisles jammed, as usherette and hypnotic trance deserts post to listen to Brad Morgan. Look out! Whew. Well, all right. Sounds like a good idea. Get Brad and the photographer up here and I'll get the girl. So, and make it snappy. I'm not used to waiting around. And frankly, I don't think it would be fair to make an exception in your case. Randall, send the girl on aisle three up here immediately. Yes, sir. Well, I guess that's that. Mr. Crawford wants to see you now. Mr. Crawford? See the spot I'm in. Yes, you certainly are in a spot. You know, when he looks through that gag, he sees you upside down. Yeah, well, no man's gonna see me standing on my head. Okay, get him set. Put your arm around her, Brad. A pleasure. May I, in the interest of publicity? In the interest of publicity, you may. Is that publicity? Uh-huh. And uh, you're a publicity man? What do you think? Inky, you stinky. I can't help it. Look pretty now, hold it. That's it. Okay, Jane. 
Is uh, that in the interest of publicity, too? Uh, that's the artist in him. Everything he does, he does with feeling. Oh, oh thanks, young lady. <clears throat> uh, Randall? Yes, sir? Nice girl, that. We should have more around here like her. See that she gets $5 bonus for the picture. Yes, sir. That's all. <clears throat> Inky? Uh -huh. I think you deserve something, too. Well, what can you think of? Anki, you know what we were talking about this morning? Well, that's right. <clears throat> I have a great institution here, Inky, and I want to show my appreciation of your efforts. Now, you've been asking for something for some time. And after talking to Maxine this morning, I decided to ensure her happiness. I want a raise! <laughs> Die, you fool! Anki, Anki, calm yourself. What now? I just wiggled off the hook. My matches. Almost a bride. Some girls don't know when they're well off. Well, here we are. Where's Brother Crawford? Mr. Crawford's not in a very merry mood. Sit down, rest your skull. Come on, ruination. Do you mind if we take these chairs, sis? I'd lead them right where they are if I were you. Hmm. Hospitable, ain't they? Anki gave Jane a bonus for this. Seems like everybody can get more money but you. Listen. What do you have to do to attract a man's attention at the breakfast table? You might try standing on your head. Or fainting. Fainting always attracts attention. Oh! 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 Water, quick! Gosh, that coffee's hot. So am I, under the collar. Pleasant good morning. What'd you think of the story? If I was the boss, I'd give you a raise. I wish you'd change places with my uncle. Then he can't play a clarinet. You know, that little girl must be thrilled seeing her picture in the paper. It isn't every day that an usherette can get... get her picture in the paper with Rad Morgan. Listen, she's just an usherette because she has to eat. When she took this job, she thought she was being hired to sing. Hmm, a fellow artiste. Now, what am I going to get for a follow-up with that story? I think I'll do the following up myself. Uh -huh. Oh, Mr. Morgan. I beg your pardon, I... Uh, I beg your pardon. Oh, this way, please. Have you got a good seat in the last row, lady? Oh, you can have the whole row, but I'm afraid you can't see very well from here. Oh, I'll see everything I want to. Oh, any seat you wish, madam. Good show this week? Brad Morgan goes on at 11.30, 3.05, 6.40, and 10 o'clock. Yeah, I know that. I've never missed a show of his in my life, unfortunately. <laughs> Say, do you know you're very pretty? Thank you, sir. The customer is always right. Any seat you wish, madam. I think they ought to have your name out in lights as a special added feature. You may leave your flattery and hat in the check room to the left. You're a very efficient usherette, but not by choice, I understand. I'd like to hear you sing sometime. How about supper tonight after the show and we'll talk it over? The last feature goes off at 11.45. remember that picture. I wrote it and produced it and played the hero myself. Always played them gay society parts, strangling women and stuff. That was a long time ago and that was taken way back in 1904, in the old silent days. Yeah, the old silent days. Let's pretend this is one of them. Come on over here, Homer. I want to show you something. 
You ever see this sign wash before? Take a peek at that mug. Look at this snitch of mine. I wrote him, that's old Chief Big Ears. Played him from Nome to Chile. Gee, you're in a tight spot there, bud. How'd you ever get away from that pistol? I didn't. He killed me every night. That accounts for the dead pan. <laughs> Smart gal, Molly. She gets that from my side of the house. Why, when she was in the eighth grade. I suppose so. How'd you like to browse on a boiled dinner? Oh. Good? It's been on the family for years. Oh, thanks, bud. Ought to be ripe by this time. Hello? Oh. A lady left her purse in the 14th row, McGee. Tell her thanks. Thanks. Hey, Molly, will you look at the goofy windows? No. <laughs> They're all jiggledy-jaggledy, aren't they? Well, I've seen a lot of windows with panes, but them's the first ones I've ever seen with cramps. Oh. <laughs> Don't you get it, Molly? Pains, cramps? Pains funny, McGee. Okay, okay, I got more. Well, that's great. Brother Crawford will be tickled to death. You're using his office as a playground. But he didn't say anything about plowing furs in his Bulgarian mahogany. Oh. <coughs> Take that fumigator out of here. What's the matter with it? Smells like a hot hinge. Okay, okay. I know when I'm not wanted. But don't forget I'm hurt. Where'd you get the little knick-knack? In Peoria. Was he hard to catch? Well, he wasn't so hard to catch, but I had an awful time getting shoes on him. You catch on to it? You gotta get the right meter into it. You must be a taxi dancer. Oh, I guess you don't know who you're talking to, sis. I'm Fibber McGee. I used to be the chief ballet master of the old Nichevo Opera House in Moscow. That was before the war. <laughs> Probably started it. <laughs> you see, sis, as I always told my pupils, if you got balance, you got everything. If you got balance, you'll never get hurt. I'll never forget when I was dancing with the old Panucci troupe back in Peoria. I had to do a series of whirls along the edge of a castle wall. It was symbolical of the secret admiration of an old hag for a handsome young knight. What knight? How about Thursday? Perfect. How I know you? I'll be wearing an onion in my steak sandwich. <laughs> As I was saying, girls, I had to do a series of whirls along the edge of this castle wall like this. Uh, here, give me that chair. Hand me that umbrella, please. Thank you. As I was saying, I was gracefully pirouetting along this castle wall when all of a sudden, when all of a sudden, the old hag appears on the scene. <laughs> McGee! Heavenly days, McGee! And if you got balance, you got everything. If you got balance, you'll never get hurt. You see? I didn't know you were here. You said 9.30. Don't stop. It's good. You wouldn't kid a girl, would you? No, I mean it, Jane. Now, look, will you sing another chorus for me? All right, fine. Come on, Trump. Now, let's get a little pep into it this time. Right from the beginning. Here we go. Delighted to meet you. Delighted to know you. Permit me to show you around my heart. You look familiar, it seems. We must have met before in my dream. Nice weather we're having. Do you like canoeing? And what are you doing the next 50 years? Where do you live? Can I see more of you? 
And by the way, did you know I love you? Delighted and so excited to meet you, dear. Okay, Jane. Look, I'm going to play a slower tempo. Move over there, will you, Tom? And you do a little rhythm routine, will you? All right. All right, here we go. All set? Uh -huh. Right. Was my audition a success? You wouldn't kid a guy, would you? You were terrific. I'm going to see Crawford, and if I pack as much weight as I think I do, he'll give you a chance. Oh, I wish I could think of something better to say than just thanks. It's good enough for me. All right. Thanks. All right. You're welcome. I think we'd better take the finish over again. I think we'd better not. Go on, let him take it again. If he does, watch and learn. Uh -huh. I've played to more intelligent audiences. Jane. What's the matter, honey? Oh, I'm embarrassed. Ah, uh, don't let it throw you. Aren't you? Yeah. Don't. Watch and learn. Hello, impresario. You're already drawn a week ahead. I don't want any money. I came to do you a favor. Oh. Oh, you found a new girl for the show. Yeah. Well, listen, if you want to do me a favor, don't bring me any more discoveries. They're still sweeping up the eggs out there, your last prodigy laid. Yeah, but this one's different. She's a clever little performer. She's got it. Uh, they all had it, and they all flopped. Jane won't. Jane who? Jane Morrow. You remember the little girl I was photographed with. She deserves a break, because she can deliver. Is that the only reason? Sure. Uh-huh. Well, let me think it over, will you? I'm pretty busy right now. Okay, and you see if I'm not right. You'll thank me for sending her to you. and tell him to let Miss Morrow go, immediately. Yes, sir. What's the matter with you? It's springtime, the birds are singing. You're a very lucky girl, you've been kissed by a star. And maybe you always act this way when you're happy. I've been fired. Fired, what for? I don't know. Come in. Well, that's a fine thing. Oh, uh, Jane. You should check. Crawford said he was dismissing you on account of Brad Morgan. Oh, 
So that's it. I told you not to get friendly with that guy. I'm afraid it's for being unfriendly. If you remember this morning, I slapped his face. It's too bad. Yeah, it's too bad you lost your job. But slapping his face was great. Pardon me while I go out and fix the heel. Well, what's on your mind? This. There, you got Jane fired for that. Go on up and tell Crawford on me, too. Did you fire Jane? Ah, oh, Brad. Don't stall. Answer me. Did you fire her? Yes. All right. Get her back. Don't get excited. That's no way to ask for anything. Well, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Get her back or I go, too. Listen, I'm still running this theater. Well, how would you like to run it without me? Look, Brad, I've put up with a lot from you, but you're getting too big for your hat. Too big for this theater. Now get out and take that dame with you. Thanks. I will. How about going over to the Criterion with me? I know the head usher over there. Jane. Oh, Jane. It's Morgan. Shall I leave? Oh, no. No, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to see him. Oh, Jane. Yes, sir, the show business is a lot of luck. I mean, you can have plenty of talent, but who's going to know about it? That is, if you don't get a break. That's right. If you don't get a break, you're just another dumb piano player like me. Or you spend your life in the projection room like me. Or you direct sanitation like me. You know, there's more talent in the front of the house than there is on the stage. If that dumb manager only knew, Change and hey, wait a minute. What's the matter with you, Dames? Anyhow, this is a dance. I want some life in here. Put some boom into it. That's what I want. Boom. Let's go. See, they're all crazy around here. There's that screwy dance director out there balling the girls out because they don't give it more boom. More what? Boom. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. the volume on sound one point. Okay. <laughs> I have a little surprise for you. Jim! You see, Mr. O'Reilly, it would have been much easier to have sent me the location of the silver mine and thus affected Miss Fairchild's release. Hmm. Hello, countrymen! Here I go again with my message to you and you. But country needs his gold wolf and a lot of that do that. And a lot of mouth of food with him, not to mention Daddy yet. So wake up all of you, north, south, east, and west. One thing I must get off my chest. But the country needs his gold wolf and a lot of that do that. And a good five cents cigar, and a place to park your car. Jack! You better watch Stonewall Jackson and do Paul Vivian. We, American have no pack, I laugh the fun and cheer, cheer, cheer. Hello, countrymen. Here I go again with my message to you and you. But the country needs is boom, boom, and a lot of them do that. Let's fight with pride to hidey high, and a lot of them do Countrymen. I'm appealing to every one of you in this land. But the country needs a boom boom. And a lot of zazzle zazz. 
and a lot of mata boop boop Not to mention scary ass. <laughs> the Battle of Chattanooga. What to do we do? Is that company shoulder off and do the Susie Q? Yeah. What's going on here? I don't know, Mr. Crawford. Here I go again. With my message to you and you. What the country needs is boom boom and a lot of swinging jazz. Let us point with pride to Heidi High. Heidi High, 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 Heidi High
We can use an act like that to fill in. Uh, I'm Mr. Crawford. Like to see you two in my office. Well, that's Brother Crawford, Molly. Come on. There goes Seagoing McGee. Uh, throw him a line and get him up the office. Uh, just be a moment, James. I want to see if Mr. Crawford needs me for anything first, and I'll take you over to the Mansfield and introduce you to the head usher. All right. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how we wonder where you are. If we don't come cross you soon, everything will go to ruin. Well, it's silly, but it's true. If we don't find a headline attraction, what's going to happen to our business? And what's going to happen to your raise? I never thought about that. Mr. Crawford, I had an idea that... Mr. You... Randall, we've had too many ideas already. I just wanted him to give Jane a chance. If he'd only hear her sing, then our troubles would be over. That's it. You know, that little usherette, Jane Morrow. Oh, you've been talking to Brad. It's a frame-up. Oh, but, Uncle, you've got to give her a chance. At least you ought to hear her. Ah. Uh... I'll tell you what I'll do. If she doesn't make good, I'll turn in my uniform and go home to Mother. Promise? Yes. Take her up on that, boss. All right. I'm too weak to resist. Go get her. She's in the lobby. Okay. One lifesaver coming up. See, yeah, I don't understand it. Last night, Brad Morgan was out in light. And today, he's out without light. Jane, Jane, come on. They're waiting to hear you sing. If you click, you get Brad Morgan's job. You're kidding. Now, don't stand here and argue. They're waiting for you. You've wanted a chance like this, haven't you? Oh, you bet I have. Only I can't believe it. You're not nervous, are you? Wouldn't you be? Gee, my, my whole future depends on how I do. So does mine. Come on, McGee. Is it love or infatuation? Can this be paradise inside? We can make her bigger than Brad. Now listen. From a dizzy heart In my heart There's a plea For the keeper of this mystery Can it be
I guess I'll have to get a new car to take you home in now that you're a star. It's not so loud. You'll have me believing it. Well, it's the truth. Well, uh, a lot can certainly happen in a day, can't it? Well, you got your break, and I'm glad. Uh, thanks, Stu, and good night. Good night. A minute, please. A gentleman to see you. Surprise? Flabbergasted. Uh, Stu just dropped me off. I didn't know where you live, but he was kind enough to show me. You're a fool. Yeah, but it's fun. If I weren't, you don't suppose I'd be stowing away in a rumble seat just to see you. Well, you've seen me. Good night, and uh, drop around again sometime. If you leave me now, I'll haunt you. I won't give you a minute's rest until we've straightened things out. They can be straightened out, can't they? I don't know. Can't we sit down? Not here. My landlord doesn't allow visitors at night. Come on. Hey! Hey! Which way are you going? Oh! Can we ride in the back? Put that much snow, I'd ride on the back. <laughs> You're still a fool. And it's still fun. <laughs> Once around the park, lightly. <laughs> you know, I must be getting absent-minded. You know, when I jumped out of Stu's rumble seat, there was, there was something that I wanted to tell you. Uh, and you've forgotten it now? It's something a fellow can't forget. Morgan reads this. He has read it. He just telephoned. Why didn't you tell me that before? Why didn't you ask me? Uh, when he comes in, tell him I can't see him. Yes, sir. If you can't see me, there's something the matter with your eyesight. Kind of makes a chump out of me, doesn't it? Every girl makes a chump out of you. I told you that before. I told you she'd do it. Jane had nothing to do with it. It was your idea. Sure. It was my idea to have her take your job. That's why I fired her. And I suppose it was my idea to have her sing your song. What song? What song is Jane singing in the show? Love or infatuation. That's mine. You don't blame me for capitalizing on it, do you? No, but I guarantee you won't capitalize on it long. Hey, you're not kidding me. You framed a nice gag to make me a laughing stock, but I'm going to bounce it right back in your face. I'm going to marry Jane. Hi, Brad. This is Whitehall, the Tribune. Hello. What goes on? Yeah, what kind of a publicity stunt is this? No publicity stunt, it's a story. Stick with me and I'll give you the finish. Come on, I'll buy the breakfast. Ah, come on, Sophie. Breakfast. Not me. I'm on the wagon. Oh. telling you what he told me. Brad said he was going to marry you. Sure, and he'd marry you just to kill this. I wouldn't blame him if he did. What? Oh, it's a dirty trick. It'll ruin him in this town. Well, it isn't half as dirty a trick as marrying a gal for spite. Am I right? I don't know. I can't even get married for spite. All this isn't getting us anywhere. What are you going to do about this? Brad promised to take care of it. Lay off of him. And just to keep the record straight, Brad has never asked me to marry him. But if he does, your congratulations will be in order. Jane, don't make a sap out of yourself. Wait a minute, boss. If she loves the guy, she ought to marry him, huh? That from you? And we ought to help the love match along. 
thank you. You're crazy. All right, I'm crazy. I guess I'm crazy when I say we ought to have the wedding right here in this theater. Because all the world loves a lover. Inky, you're getting romantic. If you think you're going to cheapen my love with a theater wedding, you've got another guest coming. Inky isn't trying to cheapen your love. He just wants to do the right thing by Brad. So do I. Sure, we put him behind the eight ball. But don't you see, if you marry him with a big belly hoe and standing room only, you'll be telling Mr. and Mrs. John Public you love the guy and that you didn't break his heart. Don't you see, you'll be putting him right back in public popularity. And that's where Brad belongs. You're not fooling me. All you're thinking of is your box office. But it will bring Brad back. And for that reason, I'll do it, if he asks me. How am I doing? I can see the headlines now. Married in spots where they first met. Remember where you first met me? Uh-uh. You were peeking over a transom. Come in. Before you say a word, will you marry me? Before you can think it over? Yes. Well, thanks. You're welcome. Before you say another word, will you name the time and the place? Sure, any time you say. If it's all the same to you, Brad, I'd, I'd like to be married in the theater. All right, that suits me. You don't mind being married in the theater? Why? Do you? If I minded, I wouldn't have suggested it. Oh, well, then I don't mind it either. That's swell. Brad! Hmm? Not even a kiss? Oh. I'll, uh, I'll call you after the matinee. Did you get everything arranged? Everything. You're all invited to my wedding. In the theater. You get an invitation from Crawford. Is that the story? That's only chapter one. Here's the real punch. When you're on the door tonight, Mr. Crawford wants you to be on your dignity. When the people hand you their invitations, keep them. Don't tear them and have to give them back to Stubbs. Yes, yes, you know how to play. I know that. But get this. When you get to that wedding march, no hot licks. I don't want you to cheat, Jane, but when you throw that bouquet, could you kind of give me a head start? I will. And I hope it brings you good luck. Brad here yet? I haven't seen him. He's probably shaking in his boots somewhere. Not any more than I am. Why don't they open the doors? Well, Morgan hasn't arrived yet. Where is he? Why doesn't he hurry? If it was my wedding, I wouldn't hurry either. How long do they think they're going to wait? Oh, the fool. Well, this is the last time he'll ever get married in my theater. I bet he'd be sore about that. Uh, we'll have to stall until he gets here. What else do they do at weddings besides get married? They eat. Well, I think, sir, that Morgan or no Morgan, we should open the doors. You mean he isn't here yet? Mm-mm. You men are all alike. Well, you stand there gabbing about the men, but what are we going to do to satisfy the customers? I've got an idea. Does it rhyme? How about the show we were going to give them after the wedding? Why not put it on first? By that time, Brad will get here. We hope. Okay, get the girls together. Open the doors. I can't understand what's keeping him.
with the finish. Yeah. I'd give a hundred bucks to see Crawford's face right now. I've seen it, and it's worth two hundred. Hey, we could sneak in with it, but how could you keep out of sight? See, just stand in the back, they'll think you're a post. Wait, I know where no one will see me. We'll go up the fire escape. Imagine being a peeping Tom at your own wedding. <laughs> Run out upon your ears. My song is meant just to bring you sunshine. Here's a bar thing all a fun fly. Delighted and so excited to see you here. I've searched the theater from top to bottom, and there's no sign of breath, Mr. Crawford. Well, duck out the alley, see these cars park. Beat it down to the drugstore, see if they've seen them. Hey, what are you doing? I'm from the radio station. You fellas are on in five minutes, and this mic must be tested. But we aren't ready. I'm sorry, mister. This is a coast-to-coast -coast hookup, and I ain't fixing to get fired. Well, how do you test it? What do you do? Why, sing and talk in it. Oh, you sing and talk in it? Yes, sir. Well, go right ahead, go right ahead. Open the curtain. Well, go ahead, open the curtain. Well, go ahead, go ahead, do something, anything. Yes, you, you, go ahead. Come on, fella, come on, do something. If you want me to do something, you'll have to hand me a guitar. Stay can of the guitar, will you? You know, folks, I'm on everybody's radio, no matter where you tune. But I don't talk, and I don't dance, and I don't even croon. I'm not the handsome leading man with muscles big and strong. But I'm the guy, the lucky guy, who gets to ring the gong. For I'm the sound effects man. I'm the sound effects man. I whistle and twitter and sing like a bird. And do what the calf does when lost from the herd. For I'm the sound effects man. How I weary and plan. I'm a factory whistle that shrieks out at noon. I'm the cackle that means we'll have scrambled eggs soon. I'm the howl of the wind in an ocean typhoon. For I'm the sound effects man. <laughs> I'd like to give y'all an imitation of an old man sticking his three dogs onto a hog that's out in the tater patch, and the old man's hollering at the dogs, and the dogs is barking at the hog, and the hogs are squealing all at the same time. Hey, go get him out of that tater patch. Hey, catch him. <laughs> hey, get him. Oh, <laughs> 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 
That got him out of that tater patch, all right. <laughs> Folks, I want to give y'all an imitation of one of them airplanes floating around up in the air, and it goes up and turns a flip, and then takes a dive back down to the ground and kind of bubbles off there. <laughs> give y'all invitation to one of them little ducks. He's reciting this poem called uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary had a little lamb and swim for where it's gone. And everywhere that Mary went, a lamb was full of gold. Oh boy, for a plane, what? Stands her up, Jane Morrow, left waiting at the altar. Listen, Mr. Mastermind, you're going to save the Occident. The pleasure, how? By marrying Maxine. What? Right, Tara, now. Thank you, this is so sudden. I cooked up a wedding, got hooked on my own line. It's the last time I'll have any big ideas. <laughs> what are you laughing at? From now on, you'll have little ones. Ah, uh, uh, boys. Put this fellow somewhere where we can find him when we want him. Okay. Hold oh, down the river. <laughs> Here. It's not very nice reading. It's hard to believe. Jane, I've been playing second fiddle to Brad all along. I was wondering if I could again, tonight. What? I'm asking you to marry me. But I don't love you. I know that. Well, I, I try my best to make you happy. Here we go. Yes, do. Go. Oh, projection room. Yeah, bird's eye view. Ready, Mr. Crawford? Is Maxine ready? Ready, Mr. Crawford. All right, boys, we're ready. Bring the trap. There's gonna be no wedding. Hey, what is this, Morgan? A double cross?
can't marry him. What do you care? Plenty. She can't. Nail him, Bill. Double wedding? Why not? Shoot him in squads. It's most unusual, but I suppose it can be done if uh, everyone is willing. We're willing, aren't we, Inky? Uh-huh. Chances. Take it easy, Toots. You want to get us fired? That extra's on the street already. An elephant stampede in Africa. <laughs> Cherry blossom time. Do you, Maxine, take this? Hold it! Stop that wedding! Don't do it, Jane. I'm sorry. Before you say a word, will you marry me? I mean it. That's all right, Jane. Stop! Hold it! What's this all about? You signed an autograph for me in Whisper Vista. But my dear woman, I... Don't you my dear woman mean you, big Lugan. Give me back my fountain pen. <laughs> I'll take care of you as soon as he takes care of us. Well, goodbye. Enjoy yourselves. Have a good time. But be back for Monday matinee. Go <laughs> on. Hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. Tonight I thought I'd come on and talk a little bit about Mary Livingston. Uh, as some of you may have picked up already, uh, I really, really enjoy Mary Livingston. I think she delivers lines uh, really, really well. And that uh, some of the lines she delivers, I don't think anybody else could really touch. Last, uh, And I think at 1937 this season, she's like at her peak about. Uh, last week, uh, some of those lines she gave were just amazing readings. Uh, just brought down the house. Um, so if you haven't listened to the last few weeks' episodes, they really spotlight Mary well. Well, tonight's episode 
is about Mary's movie, or at least it's mentioned in here. Well, uh, Mary, uh, by herself, wasn't in very many movies. She was usually in, featured with Jack in his movies. But this is the only movie I can think of where Mary has a fairly major role as a character that is not herself, uh, based on herself, but anyway, it's not herself. She has a, a name. Um, and the picture that she, this she is in is called This Way, Please. And it came out in 1937. And uh, this is the episode where they kind of spotlight that to give her her little bit of uh, PR push for her film. She's not the main actress in the film. If you look at the credits on Internet Movie Database, she's down, you know, a third of the way down. But she is in the film, and she does have a, a substantial role. So if you ever get a chance to watch This Way, Please, it's fairly well rated. Um, it has Betty Grable in it, which is pretty cool. Um, anyway, just I, I just uh, love listening to Mary, and I think she gets the short end of the stick a lot of the time. A lot of it due to um, rumors and things about her personal life with Jack and and uh, the way she treated him and the family members and so forth. Um, but that being here or there, I think a lot of Hollywood people do a lot of uh, different things uh, in their private life. But I think uh, I like to focus on Mary and the performances she gave, and I think she was fantastic. To me... Uh, there's basically Mary Livingston, and there's Gracie Allen, and there's Lucille Ball, and there's uh, Portland Hoffa, and um, Miriam uh, Jordan, and those women are just the absolute epitome of top flight acting for radio, and they all did a brilliant job, and they all did unique performances that the others... Uh, couldn't really take over. It, it's interesting that uh, they each gave performances that are unique and powerful and funny and interesting, but they're all individual and they all they're not um, cookie cutter performances where you can't take uh, Gracie Allen and put her instead of um, Mary Livingston. The type of humor just doesn't work, and the same thing goes vice versa, which I think is is interesting because I think a lot of the female performers today, unfortunately, the way they're written, not not the actresses themselves, but the way they're written, you could take a lot of the sitcom female parts and take the actresses and move them around in your head, and you could say, oh, well, she could do that part, and the other person could do this part, and they're fairly interchangeable. But uh, back then in radio, they weren't. So I give these women a lot of respect, and I uh, hope you do too. Anyway, have yourselves a great week. Um, sorry about uh, lately. I keep on having problems with uh, Potomatic since I upgraded. It sort of sometimes uh, downgrades on me uh, for some reason and then says I'm eating too much bandwidth and I won't let me load shows. And that's why Monday I didn't get my shows loaded right like I wanted to. We're back up and running. They assure me that's not going to happen again. We'll see. <laughs> I just think there's going to be a few glitches here, and that's okay. We'll work through them and uh, try and bring you the best quality shows we can. Enjoy Jack Benny. We'll see you again tomorrow for some Western Wednesday. Um, I don't know what else I'm bringing you from Bob Hope, probably. And uh, anyway, oh, and, and today I didn't bring you the Hallmark Playhouse this week because last week was the season finale, so we'll be back to Hallmark Playhouse in the fall. Thank you so much for tuning in. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston and Phil Harris and his orchestra. The orchestra opens a program with Fine and Dandy. <laughs> the month of weddings, and here's a special hint for June brides. 
In planning your first menus, have Jell-O often for dessert. For all men, like everybody else, enjoy Jell-O's extra-rich fruit flavor. You can serve Jell-O in hundreds of different ways, in salads as well as desserts. And on each package, you'll find one or more helpful new Jell-O recipes. And here's another grand thing about Jell-O. It's so easy to make. Why, it takes no time at all to turn out a dessert that looks as if you'd worked hours over it. Remember that Jell-O is a great help in making your menus deliciously different. And always keep a supply of Jell-O on hand. But when you order Jell-O, be sure you get the real thing. Genuine Jell-O. Look for the big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O. It was fine and dandy played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man who looks twice as good as ever before, but oh, how he looked before, Jack Benny. <laughs> well, well, well. Yes, sir. Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And thanks, Don. Thanks very much for the compliment. If it was. I mean... Well, Jack, I couldn't help observing how rapidly you've improved since your illness. Really, it's amazing. Oh, there's nothing unusual about it, Don. We Bennies are a sturdy family. You know, very unlollipoppy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, Jack, you certainly are the picture of health. I feel good, too. And you know what's been doing it, don't you? Plenty of fresh air and exercise. Well, that's news to me. Do you really go in for exercise? Oh, passionately. <laughs> 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 Why, I'm on my third rowing machine. <laughs> By the way, Don, when, uh, where are the uh, next Olympic Games? Mm, in Japan in 1940. Gee, I wish they were sooner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jack, I had no idea you were such an athlete. Oh, yes, yes. Well, tell me, Jack, uh, just what is your formula in the pursuit of muscular stimulation? Well, I, uh, uh, what was that, Don? I say, what do you do for exercise? Oh. 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 <laughs> well, Don, the first thing in the morning, I fling back the covers and jump out of bed. Uh, then I do my breathing exercises. What's that? I smell my breakfast. <laughs> uh, by that time, I'm ready for my, uh... oh, hello, Kenny. Hello, Jack. What are you fellas talking about? Exercises that have been building him up. Oh, exercises. I train her. You have? Uh, what does he do for you, Kenny? Oh, he takes me for a run through the park, and then he makes me jump through hoops, and after that he makes me balance a ball on my nose. Yeah. <laughs> but, Kenny, you've got an animal trainer. What? An animal trainer. Well, he certainly did wonders for me. <laughs> he did, huh? You should see me bury a bone. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny, you're positively silly. Oh, yeah? Well, I've got a smart brother, and he's starving to death. Oh. <laughs> well, well, I surrender. Oh, say, Don, uh, what's the matter with Phil? He's standing over there by himself. Why doesn't he join us? Well, you know, Jack, he's probably embarrassed about that wristwatch incident last week. Oh, well, he should be, giving me a watch for Christmas present and not keeping up the payments. Oh, well, you should worry. Yeah, say, what's a watch to me? I can always call up Central and find out what time it is. <laughs> sure. Of course, I'll look funny walking around with a telephone on my wrist. <laughs> Build a booth around it and nobody will see it. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And I can hang a phone book on my ear. Imagine me walking around with my stomach full of nickels. <laughs> Well, if I were you, Jack, I wouldn't be angry at Phil. He didn't mean it. Oh, I'm not mad at him, Don. I love Phil. But it's the principle of the thing. After all, you know, I've done a lot for that rat. <laughs> well, take it from me, Jack. He feels pretty bad about it. Uh, bad enough to buy me a new watch? No. Oh, hello, Phil. Hello.
I didn't see you in back of that fist. <laughs> How are you? I'm all right. And I want to tell you, Jack, I'm sorry about that watch. Oh, forget about it, Phil. You know the old saying, easy come, you can't keep it. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello, Jack. Hello, Don. Hello, Phil. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. Hello, Joe. <laughs> Joe? Who's Joe? My uncle. He's listening in. Oh. <laughs> well, Mary, uh, Mary, do you notice any change in me? How do I look? Mm, you look swell, Jack. Gee, you're so tan and muscle-bound. <laughs> muscle-bound? Why, Don told me I look better than I ever did. Oh, Don's full of baloney. Is that so? Jack's full of nickels. <laughs> Listen, Mary, Don noticed a great improvement in me, and it's because I've been taking a lot of exercise. That's what's doing it. That's nothing. I exercise, too, every morning. You do? Uh, well, tell me, Mary. Get this, Don. Uh, tell me, Mary, what is your formula in the pursuit of muscular stimulation? Uh, do you want a specific retort, or shall I generalize? <laughs> well! <laughs> Toy with that, big boy. <laughs> Isn't she clever tonight? I'd give my annuity for a snappy answer. <laughs> There's a phone. I'll take it. Hello? Yes? It's for you, Mary. For me? Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes? Who is it, Mary? Quiet, nosy. Oh. Uh, yes, this is Miss Livingston. Oh, hello, Mr. Shower. Yes? Well, I'll try. Hold the line, please. Jack, it's Mr. Shower, my producer at Paramount. Now, what does he want? He wants me to come over to the studio right away and shoot an important scene. Can I go? Well, yes, if it's important. Maybe. Thanks. Uh, hello, Mr. Shower. It's okay, Toots. I'll be right over. <laughs> so long. Toots? That's his first name. His first name is Melville. Well, his secretary calls him Toots. Oh. <laughs> well, you better run along, Mary. After all, it's your first picture. Oh, uh, Mary, before you go, uh, I'd like to ask you a favor. Sure. What is it, Don? If there's a spot in your picture where you can mention, well, of course, I, I don't want you to be obvious about it, but if you can just squeeze in a word about those six delicious flavors, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. Yeah, but be subtle about it, Mary, you know. Anything else, Don? Well, let me see. Uh, oh, what's the name of your picture, Mary? It's called uh, This Way, Please. Gee, I'd appreciate it if you could get them to change it to This Way, Jell-O. <laughs> Yes, Mary, it only means changing one word, you know. But don't be obvious about it. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Hey, this way Jell-O doesn't make sense. Hey! hey. <laughs> well, run along, Mary, and good luck on your picture. So, so long, Mary. Mary. Goodbye. Say, hey, Jack. What? I just thought of something very funny. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, come on now, tell me, what is it? Oh, no, I'm saving it for my picture. Oh. <laughs> Bye. Gee, I can hardly wait to see it. Play, Phil.
They all laugh from Shall We Dance, played by our rollicking rhythm rascals and directed by that eminent American maestro, Mr. Phil I.G. Harris. Thanks, Jack, but what's the I.G. for? Indian giver. Wow! <laughs> I certainly sprung the trap that time. You should have been in it. Hey, I thought you went to Paramount. I came back for that joke. Goodbye. <laughs> say, Phil, do you think that gag was worth coming back for? No. And say, Jack, I don't want to harp on this, but I've been feeling kind of low all week. You're not really angry about that watch, are you? No, Phil, of course not. And don't worry about it. Let me tell you something, Phil. There's something greater than the material things in life. Something beyond and above earthly possessions. And Phil, I value your friendship more than all the watches in the world. Jack, you're kidding. I sure am. <laughs> Well, to show you my heart's in the right place, I'll buy you a present next week that'll make up for everything. Yeah, well, get me something I can nail down. <laughs> or at least something I can eat. All right, I'll get you a plunk steak. That's plank. No, it's plunk. I'm going to hit you over the head with it. <laughs> Fine friend. Phil, you're the kind of a guy who could split up Damon and Pythias. Are they still running around together? <laughs> I don't know. I missed Winchell's broadcast. <laughs> I wish somebody would knock on the door or something. What a coincidence. <laughs> Come in. Well. Hi, you buck. <laughs> Andy, I'm glad to see you. Same here. Say, you're quite a stranger. I haven't been around in almost a month. What happened? Well, I started down here several times, buck. Then I thought, oh, there's no use putting on my shoes just for that. <laughs> Why? Is that so much trouble? Well, I don't mind putting them on. It's the buttoning that gets me. Uh, oh. Say, I hear you were pretty sick. Yes, Andy, and I was kind of disappointed that you didn't send me anything. Well, I was going to send you flowers, but Ma said, better wait and see which way it goes. <laughs> Well, I, I feel all right now. You know, I've been exercising. You ought to try it. Huh? Buck, by the time I get through plowing and chopping wood, I ain't got no time for it. Oh, naturally, naturally. About the only real exercise I get is helping Ma carry Pa up to bed. <laughs> Why, is the old boy that lazy? Yep, most every night he comes home dead lazy. <laughs> I get it, I see. <laughs> Say, where's Mary? I'm over at Paramount working on my picture. Go away, Mary. What were you saying, Andy? I said, where's Mary? Oh, she had to go over to Paramount to work on her picture. She did? You know, I'm working over there, too. I'm with Bing Crosby. Oh, you and Bing, huh? <laughs> yeah, say, Buck, do you think two crooners in one picture is overdoing it? <laughs> no, Andy, no. You and Bing don't sing anything alike. I don't know. He's coming along pretty fast. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't worry about it. Huh? Say, Andy, have you got any cute girls working with you? Mm, mighty cute, Phil, but they ain't cooperating worth a darn. They ain't, eh? Well, maybe they prefer Bing Crosby. After all, he's a ladies' man. That's what I told you. Two crooners is too much. <laughs> there's something to that, huh? Uh, but there's one thing I can't understand, Buck. What's that? Well, if those gals are so stuck on Crosby, why do they let me run out and get them sandwiches all the time? <laughs> Well, they, they must like you, too. I know, but it gets pretty monotonous hearing them say, Oh, honey, to Bing and Ham on right of me. <laughs> well, cheer up, Andy. You may work yourself up to chicken salad. <laughs> well, that's pictures for you. You know, I'm starting on one myself pretty soon. It's called Artists and Models. Have you got a good part? Only the leading role, Andy. Say, Jack, what did you say the name of your picture is? Uh, Artists and Models. Artists and Models? Why, they've been shooting that for six weeks. They have? Well, I better get over there. <laughs> Immediately. Yeah, if you want to get in it. Say, maybe I better call them up and see about it. What's the number of Paramount, Andy? Have they got a telephone? Why, certainly. Shucks, and I've been sending carrier pigeons. <laughs> Give me that phone. 
Operator, get me the uh, Paramount Studio, Hollywood. And I bet they're trying to put something over on me. You know, Andy, I had a hunch that... Hello? I want to speak to Mr. Gensler, please. Yeah. You know, Andy, I had a hunch... Hello, Mr. Gensler? This is Jack Benny. Yeah. Uh, say, what about my picture, Artisan Models? Oh, all right, then. What about Artisan Models? <laughs> Well, I understand you've been shooting it for six weeks. When are you going to get to me? I'm not worried. What? Well, don't I come out of the barrel at all? <laughs> oh, at the finish. I see. Oh, well, all right, Mr. Gensler. Goodbye. What did he say, Buck? Well, he said he's saving me for the climax of the picture. The important part is right at the end, you know. That's why they have the finale there. That's know? a great idea, Jack. They need a fella like you. Yeah, that's what he said. No matter how good the picture is, you've got the personality, ability, and magnetism to give it that terrific final punch. You can put it over with a bang. Phil, you're kidding. I sure am. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Mr. Harris. That's my career you're kicking around. <laughs> yeah. Well, Buck, I gotta... <laughs> I gotta leave you now, Buck. I'm due back at the studio myself. Say, Andy, I think I'll go along with you. I'm kind of anxious to see how Mary's doing. Mind if I go along, Jack? Not at all, Don. You want to join us, Phil? I'd like to, but who'll lead the orchestra? Oh, come on. After 37 weeks, they're not going to start looking at you now. Okay. <laughs> Can I come along too, Jack? No, Kenny, you stay here and do your song. You can join us later. Come on, fellas. So come on, Kenny. Kenny. Oh, gosh, they all left. Oh, well, what are you going to sing tonight, Kenny? I'm going to sing I Know Now from the Singing Marine. Atta boy, sing, Kenny. Uh. Discover your mistake. It doesn't show your weakness, it shows you're strong. When you admit a blunder that you please. Paramount Studio. Fred McMurray. I'm sorry, lady. Mr. McMurray can't see you. Well, don't get mad. He can't see me either. <laughs> well, fellas, here we are. Yeah, I wish I didn't have to work today. Are you sure we can get in the studio all right, Jack? Of course we can. I'm not under a contract here for nothing. Don't tell me you get paid. <laughs> now, what do you think? <laughs> That'll keep you quiet. Paramount Studio. Just a moment, please. 
You're wanted on the set, Mr. Devine. Thanks. Get me a ham sandwich first. Okay, see you later, Buck. So long, Andy. Well, here's the information desk. I'll find out where Mary is. Oh, young man. Yes, sir? Uh, I'm uh, Jack Benny. Could you tell me where this way, please, is shooting? I could, but what have you ever done for me? <laughs> Well, this is the information desk, isn't it? Say, are you trying to bribe me? <laughs> now, look here, young man. What stage is Mary Livingston working on? Stage seven. Thanks. How do I get there? You can walk or I'll take your piggyback. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, fellas. We'll find it ourselves. <laughs> Say, who needs him? Wasn't he a fresh guy? Hey, Jack! Jack! Jack, here comes Kenny. Well, you certainly made it fast. How'd your song go over, Kenny? You know me, Stuff Baker. <laughs> well, take a hold of Don's hand. We're on our way over to Mary's. Hey, this is quite a studio, isn't it, Don? Oh, uh, it sure is. I'll bet you know all the big movie stars here, don't you, Jack? Most of them, Kenny. After all, I work here. You know, fellas, I'm certainly anxious to see how... Hey, Jack, Jack. Here comes Marlene Dietrich. Where? Oh, yes. Yeah. Hello, Marlene. <laughs> Oh, Miss Dietrich, hello. <laughs> that didn't work either. <laughs> I guess she didn't recognize me without her makeup on. <laughs> She's pretty, isn't she? Huh? She's my dream girl. Well, wake up and live. <laughs> dream girl. Jack, isn't that Gary Cooper standing over there? Where? Oh, yes. Hiya, Gary. Hello, Sam. <laughs> Sam. That was my name in my last picture, you know. <laughs> well, here's stage six. We're almost there. Say, Jack, there's a man that looks just like Abraham Lincoln. Well, he ought to. It's his statue. <laughs> oh. Well, here we are, fellas. Stage seven. Follow me in. Quiet! Quiet on the set! Yeah, I guess they're... I guess they're ready to shoot. Oh, boy, look at those curls, girls. See you later, men. Woo-hoo! <laughs> mm, leave it to him. Oh, pardon me, uh, sir. Miss Livingston is working on this set, isn't she? Yeah, but I wouldn't bother her right now. She's in a very bad mood today. Very temperamental. Yeah, what's the trouble? Well, you know how these actresses are. Uh, there she is, Jack. Oh, yes. Huh? Miss Livingston. Miss Livingston. Yes, Mr. Florey. That's Mary's director. Try that scene again, and this time give me a little more emotion, please. Oh, all right, but I'm not a machine, you know. Just take it easy. Now, quiet, everybody. Quiet! 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 Who, me? Kenny. <laughs> all right, Miss Livingston, make this a good one. Come up! We're turning. Action! Oh, what is this hollow existence? What is life but a shell? I may have million jests, but what good have they did me? Done me. <laughs> oh, darn it. Cut! What's the matter with you, Miss Livingston? What's the matter with me? Me? The man stands there and asks me such a stupidious question. Stu <laughs> stupidious? Pictures. Ah! Cinema. Ah! It's all too, too revolting. Gee, I never saw Mary act like that before. Try it once more, Miss Livingston. No, no, I can't. I really can't. Mary! I don't feel those lines. I don't feel the part. It ain't me. Wow! Now, Miss Livingston, please try and... I can't work with this crowd staring at me. People, people, people! I want to be alone. Mary, what's the matter with you? You stay out of this! But I'm only trying to help Miss Livingston. I don't need any help. I'm Robert Flory. Well, I'm Jack Benny. I'm Kenny Baker. Quiet! I'm Don Wilson, and Jell-O has six delicious flavors. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Throw that guy out! I don't care! I did my duty! Quiet! 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 What are you doing tonight, babe? Nothing filthy. Quiet! Now, Miss Livingston, please control yourself and let's try that scene again. All right, but this is the last time. Now, Mary, Mary, get in there and show them what you can do. Put everything into it. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Come on now, this time you're going to get it. Ready? Camera up. We're turning. Action. Go ahead, Miss Livingston. Oh, what is this hollow existence? Oh, what is this hollow existence? What is life but a shell? I may have millions, yes. 
But what good has it done me? Money, money, money! That can't buy happiness. Hey, Bert! Shh, quiet, Andy. Quiet. I crave affection. I'm hungry for love. I'm starving. I tell you, starving! Where I go again for sandwiches! <laughs> Take mine salami! Oh, what is this hollow existence? Cut, cut, cut! Sardine orange toast! Put the bag on pie! Quiet! 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 Ice cream is a great American specialty, and here's how to make the finest ice cream you ever tasted. Make it with Jell-O ice cream powder, the new improved product which makes delicious creamy ice cream right at home. Ice cream made this quick, easy way is more economical too, for you actually use less cream and get more ice cream. You make it right in the freezing trays of your refrigerator, or you can use an ordinary hand freezer and get the same delicious results. All you do is combine Jell-O ice cream powder, some milk, some cream and sugar, and you'll soon have a quart and a half of smooth, mellow ice cream. A quart and a half, mind you, or twice as much as you get when you use most other such products. Jell-O ice cream powder comes in five flavors, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, lemon, and maple. And uh, there is unflavored, too, so that you can make any other flavor you prefer. Serve ice cream made with Jell-O ice cream powder for dessert soon. It's bound to make a big hit with everybody. Ask your grocer tomorrow for Jell-O ice cream powder. Jello series. We're with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Say, Mary, I'm surprised at you. When I make pictures, I'm not so temperamental. Neither am I. This was your idea. <laughs> Say, Jack, were we really at Paramount tonight? No, Kenny. The whole thing was only an illusion. Then I might as well tear up this phone number. Yes, Bill. Shucks, do I have to tear up these sandwiches, too? Quiet! 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 Good night, folks. The Jell-O program comes to you from Hollywood over the red network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>